Here we go. All right. Good evening. Wow, quick. Hi, how's everyone doing? Uh, I'm Jason Farben from Jacobin Magazine. Welcome to ABCs of Socialism. We're doing events all uh, every week in March. Uh, each, of, each event or each class or each lecture is, is taking up a chapter from the ABCs of Socialism, the book, which was compiled by Bhaskar Sankara and the editors of Jacobin Magazine. Verso Books published it. They're also hosting us here and running the live stream, so we really thank them for partnering us, with us and hosting us tonight. Uh, today we're taking up the question, is socialism a Western Eurocentric concept? Uh, so I don't know how closely people are following, but this is the second talk in which we pose sort of a rhetorical question to which the answer is an obvious no. Uh, although if you're here just because you think that Marxism is about uh, Europeans or white people, we can, we'll take that up in discussion. The way that this is going to work is that we're going to have Nevedita speak for 15 minutes on the subject at hand. And then we're going to have a conversation, her and I, for a, a few minutes to draw out some of the central points. And then uh, we'll let the, the folks at home go, and, and we'll turn off the cameras, and we'll open it up to discussion here. Uh, so if you have questions, hold them to the end. We'll, we'll make sure that everybody who wants to uh, gets to participate. Um, this is the session I think that I've been most looking forward to. Uh, the, the question is, is incredibly important, particularly today, but it's not one that usually gets taken up as centrally as the question of workers or uh, uh, of human nature. Um, so I think that for a lot of longtime socialists, the answer to the question, is, is socialism Eurocentric, or does it only care about white people, is, is an obvious no. But if you've been near a campus for the past 10 or 20 or 30 years, or if you've been near someone who has, uh, you've probably heard a range of attacks on socialism. Um, and you know whether you've been around for a long time or whether you're just uh, joining the, the socialist left, it's not always clear uh, how to answer these questions, which are, can be quite pervasive in, in, in certain cir circles. And the, there's a range uh, of attacks that get leveled against socialists. The kindest of these is that there's just a blind spot when it comes to, to Marxism or to socialism, that it just can't account for the non-Western world or to race. And at worst, there are charges that socialism or, or Marxism in particular are, are racist or a form of, of, of racism. And these claims are obviously a huge problem for, for three reasons. Number one, because they're insulting uh, against people who are trying to change the world, uh, the charge that we've somehow ignored or don't care about 80% of the global population is, is sort of ludicrous. Um, and oftentimes, these attacks are made on personal levels uh, to discredit socialists in movements. I know... Um, a black woman at an elite school who, who has very difficult times operating in some of these, uh, these activist circles because she gets discredited, like being a Marxist somehow doesn't allow her to speak to some, a black experience to the degree that that exists at all, as if someone needs to be a Marxist or a black person or, or, a, or a woman, I, I suppose. Um, and these sorts of attacks really sap the confidence of, of people who are coming into the movement, and what we need is more people organizing with, with, with more. Uh, confidence. The number two reason that this, these attacks are so dangerous is that there's no alternative presented, that you get attacks on Marxism, um, and that you say we shouldn't be socialists, uh, but fail to replace socialism with any sort of positive program. And in a moment where we need more organization, uh, these sorts of attacks just leave people feeling lost and depressed and guilty, and most importantly, disorganized. Uh, and the number three reason that these attacks are so important is because they're wrong. Uh, this is the most important objection, I think, because even if we didn't like the charges against socialism, even if it didn't make us feel very good, uh, and even if they didn't leave us with an idea of what to do, if they held water, then we'd be in deep trouble and we'd have to seriously rethink our project. Uh, but thankfully, these claims do not hold up. Um, whether, like I said, whether you've been around a long time or just getting here, providing all of those answers can be very difficult. So I'm really thrilled to have Nevedita Majumdar here uh, to guide us through these choppy waters. Uh, Nevedita is an associate professor of English at John Jay College. She's also the secretary of the Professional Staff Congress, which is the CUNY Faculty and Staff Union. She wrote the chapter uh, from ABCs of Socialism, which we discussed over the summer at the J at Jacobin's Brooklyn uh, Reading Group, and it was my favorite discussion we've had by far. It was the most thought-provoking and useful uh, for some of the reasons I just laid out, and I hope we're able to have a, a similar discussion here tonight, so please welcome Nevedita. Good evening, everyone, um, and thank you, um, Jason, and the organizers of this series, and thank you, everyone, to, for coming out. Um, I was saying to Jason, it really makes me happy to see a room full of 
not just people, but young people coming out to talk about socialism. Um, it is highly unusual for anyone who is above 35. They know that this did not happen up until, I don't know, five years ago. So this is excellent. Um, so let's uh, talk about the topic uh, at hand. Is socialism Eurocentric? Um, best way to talk about socialism is to start with capitalism. Um, capitalism, as you all know, is a system that is fundamentally driven by the profit motive. That is at the heart of capitalism. All the unfairness, the ills of capitalism that we know of, low wages, poor work conditions, loss of workers' autonomy, retaliation against organizers, all of this <clears throat> come from the profit drive because capitalists want to make profit, therefore all of that follows from that fundamental drive. Socialism emerges as a response to this fundamentally unjust nature of capitalism. If capitalism is rooted in the profit motive, socialism is rooted in the drive to fight for fairness and justice. Workers against all odds stacked against them always fight back. Socialism is about that fight and about the vision of a just order free of oppression and domination that animates that fight. So if that's capitalism and socialism, the question for us is, do these oppositional forces of capitalist exploitation and socialist resistance look different in different parts of the world? Um, in that chapter on, in ABCs of Socialism, I talked about um, the accident that happened in 2013 in Dhaka, Bangladesh, um, where 1,100 workers lost their lives in a garment factory accident when the walls collapsed on them. Very avoidable tragedy. Um, they knew that the building was crumbling, but they forced the workers to go work anyway. Um, I've been following that since 2015. Um, workers continue to try to organize for better wages, better conditions, and the retaliation against them is brutal. Um, in 2016, last year, last year, December, in fact, just a few months ago, um, several uh, thousand workers participated in a um, wildcat strike, and um, several hundred of them after that strike have been arrested and trumped up charges. Um, many workers, many, many more have lost their job. So it's almost routine, this kind of retaliation. Um, and, you know, Bangladesh obviously is by no means an outlier. Um, in March, um, so this month, in fact, earlier this month um, in India, the courts um, subjected 13 people in an auto factory to life sentence, their crime they were organizing, um, and several others for smaller sentences. So again, I mean, there is the Marikana massacre in South Africa. Uh, these kind of examples abound. Question is, do these things in the global south look any different than what we see over here? I would say no, they don't. Because in the US as well, we are very aware of how management responds when organizers want better wages, better work conditions. There is the same um, refusal to negotiate, intimidation, um, firing of organizers. Again, um, in that piece uh, for ABCs of Socialism, I talked about Walmart in 2015 um, closing five of its offices and 2,200 workers losing their jobs, all um, under the pretext of plumbing repairs. Um, so the retaliation may not be as, as naked, as brutal over here, but that's only because they can get away with it in that part of the world, and here they can't. And, but the drive is the same. There is no difference in what's driving the capitalists or what's driving workers. The charge that socialism is Western assumes that because of socialism's place of origin, i.e. the West, it loses relevance in the non-Western world. The fact, however, is that workers are subject to the very same forces of exploitative work conditions regardless of where they are. They work for bosses who are solely driven by, by the profit motive and have little incentive to address their needs. 
And workers everywhere also realize that their only option is to struggle if they want improved conditions. And thus, as I said again um, um, earlier, against all odds, they fight back. Now, it is not surprising then that since its inception, socialism has been fundamentally an internationalist thought in both its conceptualization and reach. This is the idea of socialism that animated Frantz Fanon in his battle against French colonialism, the communist Chris Hani in the, in, uh, the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, Amilcar Cabral as he fought the Portuguese, Walter Rodney in his activism for the disenfranchised across the Caribbean, Che Guevara in Cuba and Latin America. For them and countless others, socialism was a theory and philosophy no less relevant to their reality than it was to the reality of British or American trade unionists. When I think of socialism, I also think of Emin Roy. How many of you have heard of Emin Roy? Okay, two hands. Um, look him up, not surprising, but look him up. Fascinating personality. He was born in the late um, 19th century in a village in Bengal. He uh, got radicalized in the Indian independence movement. And in his 20s, um, Roy left India to raise funds for an armed insurrection against the British. He traveled from Indonesia to China to Japan. Then he was in the US for a while, all the time dodging authorities, making political connections, um, trying to raise both arms and money, um, and traveling in disguise for the most part. Um, he could not stay for very long in the US, um, again, because uh, he was being followed. And then he ended up in Mexico, where he got involved with the workers, organized workers, and founded what is today the Communist Party of Mexico. Um, that was in 1920, uh, in 1919, sorry. Um, in 1920, Roy also happened to be one of the founding members in Tashkent of the uh, Communist Party of India. Um, in his later life, uh, he went back to India, was jailed in horrific conditions, kept producing his writing. Now imagine how absurd the question whether socialism is Eurocentric is when you pose it in the context of the life of a revolutionary like Emin Roy from the Global South, who founded not one, but two communist parties. It's absurd, right? Now the question is that it's still a question. Why? Why then has this question of whether socialism is Western gained currency at this time? I want to suggest that a perspective like this gains resonance only at a time of defeat. Four decades of unremitting neoliberal onslaught on the poor and working people, on wages, on the kind of public funding on, of basic necessities like housing, healthcare, education, that makes a decent life possible, and the decimation of unions and working class power in general has resulted in an eviscerated left unsure of its own legacy. In this context, the question emerges from an academic left, a left that has been devoid of the lifeblood of movements. The understanding of power and solidarity that movements bring into the larger culture. Without movements, um, there is not very much awareness of what it is that animates the working class. If you are not a working class person, if you are a middle, upper middle class person, you will not naturally gravitate towards the needs and interests of the working class unless there are movements. This is why movements are important. And this is why movements in many ways changed the landscape of this country in the 60s and 70s. They certainly changed universities. But since then, you know, there has been a long period of drought. So in academia, what we have today is a well-off class who have no reason to gravitate towards working class politics. They do have an interest, however, in retaining their class privileges. So what we have is a defanged radicalism unthreatening to power structures. The notion that socialism is Western emerges from this quarter. It takes the form of a radicalism that claims to speak for the global South. 
and declares that socialism is unsuited to the realities of that part of the world. Western ideas like socialism, they argue, do not address the cultural experiences of the non-West. It's an interesting position. But notice how such a position discredits socialism, right? It's creating a rift within the left such as it is. But it is not a threatening position to anyone. However, it manages to appear radical because it claims to speak for the non-West and claims to speak for an authentic non-West. So it's managing all of that in one sweep, pretty clever. This position is also part of a larger trend in academia of a turn towards issues of colonialism, race, gender, sexuality, and such. There's nothing wrong with this at all. You cannot be a socialist if you're not an anti-racist feminist, someone who is against every form of discrimination and indignity. The problem is somewhat different. It's that analyses of these issues have been largely divorced from the logic of capital and class struggle. To be clearer, what we get today is the anti-racism of the privileged that is both unthreatening to power and disengaged with the actual sufferings of the poor and of minorities. We can talk more about this in um, Q&A, if you wish, about how it also stands to um, serve the interests of a particular class. Um, but I just want to um, quickly note here that uh, the left critique of Bernie Sanders' pres presidential run reflected a lot of this position, the critique that came from the left. A quick example would be Ta-Nehisi Coates' um, critique of Bernie for his championing of race-blind structural transformation like uh, minimum wage or free college. Because Coates argues that those kind of universal programs um, only end up primarily benefiting, the, um, benefiting whites. Now, what such anti-racism ignores is the fact that the large majority of workers who would be lifted out of poverty by raising the minimum wage would be people of color, or that the benefits of free college um, would be enormous and weighted overwhelmingly towards working class blacks. I teach at CUNY, um, you know, a university which I'm sure most of you know is 75% uh, students of uh, minority students. Um, also, more than half, for more than half of our students, their annual income is less than $30,000. Now, my students did not need any training in intersectional thought to um, understand that free college is in their interest. Why, is, why then this opposition to universal programs aimed at transforming structural inequities? And precisely the inequities that sustain racism. It's an anti-racism, one that actually enjoys huge popularity in this era, that refuses to see capitalism as the primary driver of inequality. As a result, it's an anti-racism that does not speak to the needs and interests of the working class, working class minorities as well, naturally. I would say it's the anti-racism of a privileged class. If you believe that a universal minimum wage is not particularly beneficial to poor people of color within the country, then you would, <clears throat> excuse me, then you would be similarly critical of socialist politics internationally. If socialist politics do not speak to the racial experiences of US minorities, the argument goes, it is also foreign to the cultural reality of non-Western countries. Now, some of the same forces have been at work in the global south, which has similarly witnessed a reign of unchecked neoliberal growth and the weakening of organized left resistance. Um, let me give you an example um, from, my own, um, from my own background. I was in the student left in India, and um, we were fighting as students everywhere fight for um, quality, and um, accessible education for everyone. And we were also very active in other larger social and political uh, causes. Um, I was lucky to be part of, a, part of the left in a country where it does enjoy, unlike in the US, a much larger resonance, both culturally and electorally. 
Now, do I remember being charged with uh, the idea that our fight for educational um, justice and workers' rights was Western? That we were somehow duped by Western thought in following that line? Actually, I do remember. And that charge came from the right, from the cultural right. Um, you know, they were fine with capitalism, but socialism was Western, right? As was feminism, for that matter. You know, it sounds familiar, right? Now, the delegitimization of socialism as Western by a nationalist right in the global South is, of course, understandable. What is curious, as we see, is the resurgence of the same idea that socialism is uh, Eurocentric and unsuited to the lived experience of the non-West in the Western left largely based in academia. I want you to think what this position means. It means that a Bangladeshi woman in a garment factory organizing against, you know, with, with the risk of getting fired and worse, much worse, you know, physical retaliation of different kinds. Um, that a woman like this who's getting together with others, trying to organize, trying to form a union, has a vision of what it would be to work under conditions that are not coerced, wages with which she can feed her family, might even have a decent life, that such a woman is duped, that she is somehow has been um, subjected to Western ideology and doesn't know what she's doing. That's the charge we are talking about. And um, let's be clear then. A radicalism that believes that socialism is a foreign idea in the non-West is, is one that denies the fundamental human response of fighting against oppression to workers in that part of the world. It is saying that non-Western people are incapable of in envision envisioning a just and free society. So when US radicals claim that socialism is Western, they are joining forces, we have to be clear, with the right the world over. To embrace the universality of socialism is not to deny cultural specificities. And we can talk more about this in Q&A. People everywhere live and flourish in their immediate and broader cultural, uh, sorry, cultures and communities. But human beings cannot fully thrive in any culture as long as capitalism continues to generate deprivation and powerlessness. Socialism is about the drive to fight against a dehumanized social order and create the conditions for human flourishing. It is a universal drive. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, oh, sorry, so that was super useful. There's a ton of stuff that you covered. Uh, I, I'm going to try to draw out just a few points. Uh, you know, hopefully people will get a chance to to listen to that again because I think there's a, a ton in there. And then we'll again be able to draw more out in discussion. Um, so first of all, I just want to start with you know a lot of the people in this room or at home listening or watching. Um, they may be new to socialist politics, but I actually don't think, given the prevalence of this, the sort of claims that, that you're describing, I don't think it's long before people encounter the claim that socialism is Eurocentric that, that we're discussing here. Um, and so the, the, you know, the accusation that first gets made against socialism as if it's sort of an abstract topic, then quickly gets wielded against socialists and, and to discredit them. So for people who have yet to encounter these arguments, I'm wondering, if you can briefly lay out, what, what are some of the accusations that people will, will run into? Thank you, I think and this is working, right? No, I think that's a good question um, because socialists should be prepared with an answer to that. And um, yes, yeah, sooner or later, they will um, encounter this idea that 
um, being socialist, they have been um, somehow being fooled into a Western ideology, and um, that it's also akin to racism. That it's um, you know it's the kind of um, kind of thought that um, now. What is the what is the genesis here? Why Eurocentric? Why racist? Because we saw some of it um, in in Bernie's campaign. Some of these charges charges being levied. I think the idea, um, the source of the idea is that because uh, socialists talk about the economy, talk about um, exploitation universally. They somehow miss out on the on the race angle, or um, that, internationally speaking, they miss out on the on um, the realities of um, other countries. Um, I think it's of course bogus because um, if we okay, let's uh, first talk about domestically. What socialists are saying is that. Um, Inequality is produced from capitalism, from an economic system which very systematically exploits people, right? Um, and racism is something that feeds off in that system. It's not the same as exploitation, but racism is something that, that cannot be sustained beyond a point if, if it is a just system. Nor can you solve racism without solving poverty. Right, and um, you know, so conceptual level, it doesn't work. Historically, as I was saying in my talk, all over the world, we have seen that socialism um, has inspired and mobilized millions all over the world in different kinds of movement. Um, and in this country, the civil rights movement was very much influenced by socialism. This is a new thing. This is a new thing where we are seeing that um, you know the, the, this sort of dichotomization of race and class politics is, is not something that, has, uh, that this country has always seen. It's, it's new, and once again, it's symptomatic of the ascendance of capital. Because, I mean, who stands to gain if, if you separate the two? If the system doesn't have to be changed, if all you need to do is hire more uh, you know, black managers, hey, that's cool, that works for the system. So in the, in the chapter in the ABCs of Socialism, you explain really well, and you, and you did this in your mm -hmm. talk as well, uh, why capitalism is a, it's a universal system, which tends to behave similarly in different parts of the world. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it, it, you know, what people are pointing to isn't entirely wrong. There are clearly observable differences between groups of people. Right? Mm -hmm. This is what we call culture. Culture mm -hmm. looks different elsewhere. So how can socialists remain committed to an understanding of capitalism as uh, operating more or less similarly and account for difference, right? How do we do both of these things? Oh, excellent question. Thanks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, this idea that um, socialism generates homogeneity, it's, it's a very common misperception. Um, socialism has nothing to do with homogeneity. Um, having said that, before we talk about difference, I just want to take a moment, however, um, and talk about what socialism does believe in. It does believe that um, human beings, when confronted with oppression, with coercion, do not like it. Not only do they not like it, they fight back. It is something that is true across cultures and across time. So yes, we'll come to differences, but it's very hard to be a socialist if you do not believe in this common humanity of all people. What, I mean, you know, what are our, uh, what, what options do we have of not believing in this common humanity? If you don't, then either you are left with the idea of people who are completely individualized, atomized, um, or you are left with the racist premise that people are different everywhere. Both of them are demonstrably false. So there is a common bedrock of humanity, and socialism comes out of that. 
Having said that, socialism, is, socialism, the way I understand it, is primarily about creating the conditions for human flourishing and thriving. Of course, human beings have always lived in cultures and communities. That's where we are embedded, and that's where we will always be. But difference has to be predicated on equal access to resources. Otherwise, what's the point of difference? You know, oh yeah, great culture somewhere there in sub-Saharan Africa, and you know, they don't mind being poor. We would, be, we would end up saying things like that. So yes, we, we, uh, we respect difference, we celebrate difference, but there cannot be that celebration without first making sure that we can live in, in conditions of justice and equitable distribution of resources. So I'm really glad you brought up that, the, the point about Sub-Saharan Africa, because you know, I, I spent a little, a little bit of time in the academy, and what, what I was struck by then and now is, is how arguments about fundamental differences between the East and West are you know, all over the place. And this winds up making its way into activism, of course, in, in different ways. But you know, this is, these are usually put forward by people with anti-racist intentions, right? right? Um, but the claim itself is actually, I, I think, fundamentally racist, yeah. right? And you know, I mean, if, if, if you disagree, you, should, you know, say, but I, I wonder if you can address that, that sort of tension. I'm glad you said it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I, I do think it is racist. Um, since you spent some time in academia, and I'm sure many people here have, um, I might briefly um, bring up Edward Said's Orientalism, mm -hmm. right? I think most people are familiar with the premise that um, West, um, Western scholarship about the Orient, about the non-West, um, developed in a way that um, everything that the West was not was transferred into the East, into the transfer into the non-West. So for the West to seem enlightened, uh, to be progressive, the East had to be uh, the opposite of that, that that's how the non-West was, um, was constructed in the Western canon, both um, in literature, but also in sociology and other branches of knowledge. So, so it was an, you know, an essential idea of East you do not quite get the reality of the East. There is, a, uh, there is a gap between the actuality of the East and the representation that you see in the Western canon. That was, um, that was primarily Said's thesis. Fine, I mean, there might be problems with it, but you know, the basic idea, I believe, is true. Where do academics then go from there? Once you see that, the response should be, yes, so let us then tell the truth about the non-West. Let us retrieve the histories of the non-West. Um, let us show the world that you know, the non-West people struggle the same way, people love the same way, people have similar cultures or different cultures. Whatever it is, that that's where the thrust should be to, um, to bring out the particularities and the differences, of, um, the particularities and the similarities of the non-West, the histories of the non-West. Instead, what we have seen in academia is that um, they have taken the sides, they have taken sides premise and um, kept it. They have said, yes, the East is East, um, and it is in many ways inscrutable as far as the West is concerned. However, the only difference is it's good. It's changed the value. It's, it's instead of saying that the West is, you know, this, um, this place of um, darkness and what have you, this is, this is what's happening in the East, and this is good, and it's the West that may or may not be problematic. So it's kept that structure intact, but just changed the valuing of it, so which doesn't, you know, make any difference. It keeps that racist premise intact of categorizing um, entire communities of people as different. You know, it, it's, it's also like uh, very similar to Huntington's um, 
uh, treaties that uh, of clash of civilizations, that there are discrete civilizations. So it's, it's surprisingly similar, even though it comes from this you know, liberal left group, as you're saying. And it makes me think that you know, at the same time that, that this sort of, you know, sort of rejiggering of Orientalism is happening, that the claim, you know, the claim that Marxism is Eurocentric literally means that Marxism can only understand Europe, which you know, says that Marxists have nothing to say about the developing world or don't understand, which is incredible to think about the contributions that Marxists have made. You, you named a few. And so I wanted to sort of just come back to that and give you a chance to elaborate. Because people, again, you know, maybe new or may not be familiar with this. Can you talk for uh, you know, just a moment about the contributions that Marxists have made, both from the third world and, and regarding uh, the, the developing world? Yeah, I think that's quite true that at present in this climate, one could very well take a few courses and, um, or get into politics for that matter and leave with the notion that um, Marxism and Marxists do not address the non-Western world, which is completely wrong. I mean, Marxism from the very beginning has been focused on, um, on, on non-Western countries. For one reason, it's because that's where the revolutions happened. You know, so for different reasons, Marxism and because, you know, it is, it is at heart a system which is about exploitation, about human suffering, it trained its eye on that part of the world where you see that kind of exploitation and suffering, you know, at its most intense. So in, in Marx's own work, in Lenin's work, in Mao's work, you see the, um, the, the insistence on um, trying to understand those parts of the world. And, you know, um, later theories like dependency theory or world systems theory, whatever one might, you know, one can have agreements or disagreements about these things. But the point is there is a rich Marxist tradition of trying to understand the non-Western world, uneven development, how, what is the relationship between feudalism and capitalism, not only in the West, but in the non-West. So this all has been completely a part of the Marxist, uh, you know, Marxist scholarship. And um, like you said, um, I mentioned this um, in my talk that um, scholars all over, uh, all over the non-West have uh, taken on the prism of Marxism to understand. You know, I mentioned Fanon, and I mean, I just uh, mentioned uh, Mao, um, C.L.R. James. I mean, there are numerous such, I mean, that, to me, again, it's, it seems absurd to say that Marxism does not say much about, uh, about the non-West. In fact, I do not know any other tradition that does more than Marxism. So uh, this is uh, my last question, and I, and I just want to read uh, something that you wrote in the ABCs of Socialism. You wrote, capitalism does not merely oppress workers on the factory floor. It creates an entire culture in which the logic of oppression and competition become common sense. It turns people against each other. And we've discussed this a little bit in, in each session, but I think it's important to bring up now, because what this, uh, what this suggests is that the building class struggle, building working class struggle, then requires overcoming obstacles amongst workers. And that it means challenging things like racism and sexism and nationalism um, and other forms of, of bigotry amongst some sections of the, work, of the working class. And then elitism in, in other sections of the working class and in all these sorts of divisions. So I find that oftentimes left debates around these questions can become overly uh, binarized. So for example, with race, it's, it's either we talk about class or we take up race, or we take up class or we take up gender, it's, it's, and so on and so forth, right? So I guess the last question I ask you is how do we do both effectively in a way that draws, the, draws this out clearly? Um, <clears throat> okay. I. I want to answer this question in two parts. How we do it. Um, I think we do it in, in a particular way when we are organizing, as organizers. And, you know, I, um, I'm a union organizer myself. When you go talk to people, you engage the whole person. 
you don't engage this or that aspect of their reality. You, you sit down and you listen and you talk to them. And you, know, you engage with their deepest held beliefs of different kinds. And some of those could be misogynistic, racist, or what have you. Um, and it is the organizer's task then to draw connections between those beliefs and aspects of their lived reality and show the disconnect, you know. So a worker could very well believe that, you know, the immigrant worker or the black worker is the problem. Then it becomes the organizer's task to show other aspects of that worker's life and say that that's not the issue here. The issue is the boss. You know, you remember such and such time this happened and now this has happened. So when you talk to people, when you organize, you have to, um, you have to engage these different aspects of people's deeply held beliefs. There is no separation of, um, you know, of race, class, or, you know, whatever else. Um, having said that, I also believe, though, analytically, this is at the level of organizing. Analytically, we, also, we have to be clear as socialists, and I said this in my talk, that capitalism is the primary driver of inequality. So when we say that we want to do um, race and class, they are not at the same level. Yes, we want to get rid of racism. How could we not? But you cannot get rid of racism unless you understand and fight against capitalism. It is, it is a first, yes, it is a primacy, and people are afraid to say this now, people are apologetic, but I don't see how um, you can be a socialist without granting this primacy to the economic. To the economic. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, you know, that's at the level of, um, that's at the level of analysis. Um, again, I mean, to, you know, to um, maybe elaborate on it a little bit, uh, on the question of race and class, if you take class out, right, as a socialist, then all you are left in terms of anti-racist politics are, you know, programs like affirmative action, which are great. But what is affirmative action other than fighting for crumbs? The pie is the same. You're not changing how much people are going to get. It's like, OK, we'll get a little bit more. But unless you change capitalism and you enlarge the pie, not only enlarge the pie, but make sure that the conditions of enlarging the pie are in your interest, in the long run, you're not doing much. So in other words, that has to be, that understanding of the economic has to be very, very fundamental. And then, you know, from that follows everything else. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Let's thank Nivedita. Well.